I guess it's time for us to start. This, this is a session on boat building, and uh, the, uh, Mr. Keith Fedler and Thomas Colvin here, uh, if you've seen their boats outside probably by now, the, uh, they speak for themselves. The, uh, my name is Pete Gregory, and I'm an anthropologist here at Northwestern. And the, uh, I grew up in the Delta. Uh, my grandfather was a boat builder. So that's, that's why I'm here, I guess. And uh, I just left a furniture session. I don't know anything about furniture. Boats, I'm a little better. <laughs> so what we did with the furniture session was we kind of sprung it on these guys and uh, opened it up to Q&A from, from the people out there. So if you have a question, just yell out at us. And uh, I, we started off by asking people to talk about how, how they came to do what they do. Uh, how they came to build boats or build furniture in that case. And in this case, how do you guys build boats? Why do you build boats? And, uh, how'd you get started? Uh, and the other question is that uh, are there, both of you build dugouts and are p rows, log p rows. So maybe we could get y'all to talk to us about that. So Keith, can we start with you? Sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, my name is Keith Felder. I'm from Denham Springs, Louisiana. Uh, I went to uh, high school there. When I got out of high school, I went in the Navy. And then when I got out of the Navy, I went to work for Ethel Corporation. I put lead in gasoline. Did that for 37 years. And at the end, I was trying to find something to do in my old age before I retired. And I went around and tried a few different things, but I had a, they had the boat uh, show at Madisonville. And I, I went there and I said, you know, there's a lot of pretty boats there and I thought that'd be fun. So I had talked to some people there uh, about uh, teaching me how to build the particular boat that they made. Most, most of the older boat builders built just one style of boats. And if you wanted that style, you went to him to get it. And, uh, but they wouldn't show any outsiders how to do it. That was the, the family uh, livelihood. So they just, they taught their kids how to do it or their grandkids how to do it. And it stayed in the family. But when I came along, uh, it was almost 2000, uh, the, the kids didn't want to do it no more. They wanted to go uh, work for Exxon or, or somebody drilling all or building houses where they could make money. They grew up in a family where they built boats and uh, they decided they didn't want to build boats that wasn't, wasn't very good living. Where they could go to work for an oil company and they could make a lot of money. And so when I came along, they were, those old boat builders were getting old and they didn't want to die with that knowledge buried with them. So when I asked uh, one of them if he'd show me, he was glad that somebody was interested in knowing how to do it. And so uh, he showed me how to build his style of boat. And I was still working then, so I would take a week's vacation and go, go stay with him and learn how to build that type of P-Row. I didn't know there was more than one, one kind of P-Row, but there's different, a lot of different kinds. And so the next year I went and met another guy and I learned how to build his style. And so I did that. And then they had the, uh, at, at Thibodeau, at Nickel State, they had a, a wooden boat building class. I went down and, and took the class and, and you could make uh, uh, different kinds of boats. And I wanted to make a Piro and, uh, and so I took that class and learned how they did it. And uh, so after I retired, uh, I started uh, making p rows because I like to do it. And, uh, but after a while, my shop was full p rows and I, I couldn't build any more. So then I started selling them. But uh, along that line, I also went to the uh, boat building school in, uh, in Maine. And, and, uh, and they, they write the book on uh, wooden boats. Uh, their publication anyway. And so uh, I took a class up there on how to build strip uh, canoes. 
because I figured one day they were going to run out of wood down here. And so uh, instead of uh, making them out of uh, planks, I figured you know, I'd have to learn how to make them out of strips to make the planks go further. But anyway, during that period, uh, the only thing you made boats out of then was uh, plywood, uh, because that's, that's what everybody was making them out of back that time. But let me back up a step. My display out here shows you the progression of the Louisiana P. Row, and I have a dugout that's made out of a half a log. And when Louisiana became a state in 1812, that was the uh, P. Row. It was a dugout p -row. and they made those up until about the 1930s they started running out of wood and so they started making planks and they started building the p -rows out of planks and they made those up until about 1947 in 1947 uh, they had gotten some marine plywood they had it in New Orleans to build the Higgins boats and so after the end of the war it spilled over and the local fishermen, the boat builders, started getting the, the plywood, the marine plywood. And uh, so they, they made them out of marine plywood up until about 1960. In 1960s, uh, about, they started making them out of aluminum and fiberglass. And so it depends on, you can time them to see where they're at. Nowadays, it's hard, uh, since uh, people quit uh, building wooden boats, uh, you can't buy or it's hard to find the long plywood nowadays. Used to, they may have been long sheets. And uh, the company was in Washington State that made the marine plywood. And, and they had them on a conveyor belt where they, well, I'm not sure, it could be 100 feet long. And they would set their machine to chop them off at 12 foot, 12 foot, 12 foot, or they would be 14 foot or 24 foot. Well, they don't do that anymore. So if you want to buy marine plywood, you got to buy a four by eight sheet, and then you got to splice it together. And so you're going to get a 16 foot sheet of plywood spliced together, and then you either cut a 12 foot out of it, or, or 14, or whatever, or, or make it longer. But anyway, that's the progression of what the wood did, and that's the progression of how I made my P-rows. And so I went back and wanted to learn how to do all of them, and now I've evolved around to the other end. I'll make a chaffly basin bat toes. That's the old putt putts, and then the old putt putts is you got the engine, which is old putt putt. But in uh, and so now I'm, I'm collecting those, and they're all 100 years old uh, marine inboards. And so that, that's a I, I probably got one of the best collection in the United States of those for the Lockwood Ash. Uh, but that's, that's another story. I don't get you. But each, each style boat, uh, I make basically two different styles. I make a, uh, a swamp p row, and then I make a, a marsh p row. And uh, the, the difference is on the swamp p row, you have the chimes on the outside, and that's like a little bumper. So if you run into cypress knees or logs or the pier or something like that, concrete landing, you won't hurt your boat. You'll hit, hurt the, uh, the little chine there. On the marsh style, the chine is on the inside because down in the marsh, you, you just got mud and, and, and grass. So that's one of the, the other difference is that on the swamp pea row, the sides that I make are 26 degrees out. And on the marsh pea row, they're 36 degrees out. So the marsh has more angle on the boat. And, uh, and then the, uh, the swamp p -row has the ribs on the inside. The marsh p -row doesn't have ribs on it. So it's lighter. It's going to be lighter and it's going to be wider. And so the, the more load you put in the marsh, the wider the boat gets. It, it, it's the same thing with the shrimp. I mean, the uh, swamp p -row, but it's not at, at the same angle. So it, it, the, the swamp p -row will sit further in the water then the marsh bureau sit, marsh bureau sit more on the top. And then the, another difference is that the, uh, the swamp bureau has more rocker in it, so it's curved up, so it'll turn to go through the trees, and, uh, and it handles easier that way. Whereas the, the swamp, uh, I mean, marsh bureau 
is, is flatter, doesn't have as much rocker, and it attracts straight easier to paddle, but it's a little bit harder to turn. So you gotta decide what you're gonna use your boat for is, is which ones you want me to build. So if you got any questions, just blurt it out or stick your hand up. I'll, I'll try to answer them. But on a display out here, it shows I got four boats out there. One of them's a dugout, one of them's a plank, and I got two plywood ones. And the two plywood ones, I can show you the difference between the, uh, the smoke plywood one and the marsh plywood one. And I also, uh, another difference that most people, and, and every boat builder doesn't do it, but on mine, the front of the boat is wider than the back of the boat. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Is, is one, where you're sitting in the back, you don't want to have to reach over the paddle. You, want the, you don't want the boat any wider than and basically your shoulders. And so it'd be narrow. Whereas in the front, it, it's, it's wider. And the reason is that is you're going to push water as, at the widest point. So if your widest point is six feet from the end, then it, it, it comes out and you're gonna be pushing when you're paddling, you're pushing that water. And after it passes that widest point, it's gonna start eddying back around and that'll help move you. So if you got it the, the widest point in the middle, you're pushing more water than I am. On my boats, uh, the, the front is best. The biggest part is not in the middle. So you're building a paddle boat, closer. You're you want, for a it's a, a displacement boat is a displacement boat. I don't care if you use oars or what. You still got to push that much of water. How about flat bottom versus round bottom? Flat bottom uh, <coughs> is just about everywhere except in the mud. If you're in a place where your tide goes out, if you duck on and the tide goes out, then you want that round bottom. Uh, everybody does, doesn't build a round bottom, but I, I build a round bottom, and that's all you do is just kind of wiggle your butt a little bit, and it'll go on going through the mud. Uh, if you got a flat bottom, flat bottom is going to uh, like cause a suction, and it, it's hard to go. You know, you're sitting there trying to go, and it, it, it's kind of like glued to it. You know, it's, it's, it's stuck on it. Come on, you got to ask something. Got all kinds of stuff up here just don't want to come out. <laughs> Tom, you've been building dugouts. How long have you been building dugouts? Well, uh, I started getting interested in, um, in dugout rooms when I was about eight years old. I passed Mass Shack, uh, near, between Lake Marple and Lake Boss Train. There's an old man there by the name of Louis Barbier who was the last lighthouse keeper there uh, as, as past Manshack Lighthouse. When Katrina finally destroyed that lighthouse, uh, that finally fell in. But when I was a little boy, it was still connected to the land by narrow bridge of uh, land and been live oaks behind it there. There's an old dugout there that Mr. Barbier had. It's about 20 feet long and four feet wide. And a hole up in the bow but had a, had a mast. So it was a sailing period. Now, I had an inboard engine at one time. I could see where the, the bottom of the hull had been plugged, where the shaft log used to go through. So eventually, uh, I got interested. Tom had got to young, being a young teenager. I used to visit Mr. Barbier for years, uh, years. You know, he and his wife both spoke French. Uh, and he was telling me how his daddy and his granddaddy before, before him used to make dugouts. So eventually uh, I acquired uh, his grandfather's dugout making tools, which I still have. And he told me they were all made, made back in 1847, those tools. <clears throat> so I got interested in looking uh, for a log to make one with. I found out. That's not an easy project as you think it is, because the logs got to be just right. Get split in half. These half a logs got to be to be clear, free shakes, open knots, and so forth. You know. 
Oh, well, I haven't seen old dugouts. They had a patch where well, old open nut used to be. And it's the same thing here. Uh, I had an open nut right here, and I patched it with a piece of wood, which is dovetailed in and wedged in tight so I cannot move in or out. It's, it's this way and that way, and key down so it cannot be knocked out. And then I found another old peon maker uh, down at by a bar terrier by the name of Lino, Lino Contractors. He, he's made over 50 dugouts in his lifetime. And he gave me porters also um, how to shape dugouts, and what he did. He let me borrow a pattern that he, that he used, the pattern, this piece of cypress shaped to the profile front and back. As you can see, a dog out, the slight of water on one end, not the other. For the same reasons Keith was mentioning, you know. <coughs> and um, so I have used those patterns in making my dog outs since then. <coughs> and then I met another dog out maker uh, by the name of Emptum Alamo from Pure Part, Louisiana. And M. Uh, was a man featured in the 1947 Exxon film on um, making that dug out. Uh, I had my, my first boat in my skiff at, uh, at Old River Landing. I came in for a load of crawfish. I spent a whole year in a basin commercial fishing, which is an interesting experience. Even got to see most pickers at work on the scaffolds pulling the moss down. You know, the carrying it, you know, and the fire back there. I could see all that. I just much much over now, though, the way of life. <coughs> and um, Mr. Alamo came up and saw that my, my new dog out is on my skiff. He asked me in French, uh, did you make this? At that time, I didn't speak uh, hardly any French, except to say, comment ça va? You know, <coughs> that's all I can say. And then, now, no more. Now he switched over to English and I told him, Je ne parle pas français, Miss, I do not speak French. Uh, and he looked, he saw the holes I had bored at the bottom of the boat. And I was looking at him. It looked like uh, he was Indian, but I didn't want to ask him at first, by the way. Not at first, when the first meet, I don't ask those kind of questions. Uh, so he looked, looked at those plugs I had on there. He said, We don't do that. No, not very fun. Okay, he's Indian. So he showed me how to measure the holes by using two sticks. The stick across here, now the stick outside, inside gauge. And the difference is how thick the bottom is. So you take an axe, a foot axe, make a notch, 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 two, two inches, two inches, two inches. Then split the wood out in between the notches. And then I can work it down. Uh, <coughs> To rough it out, like then make it light enough, you turn turn it over. Uh, and, and do the outside. You have got to get the outside completely finished before you finish the inside. Because then you use your hands as a gauge to feel the thickness of the hull. So and your bumps and feel and irregularities is be the inside. So I shave that out when the, when the hand plane as you see on my table over there, where it's working on the on that paddle. <coughs> Working it down. So, so between uh, the Barbiers, uh, Lean Contractors, uh, <coughs> and the Malamo, uh, those three old time boat builders, where the people are learned from uh, how to make dugouts. Now, back in 1962, I was swimming in Lake Bosch Train, looking for flounders along the water by neck deep between the grass beds and the stumps. And I came across what I thought was half of a cypress tree buried in the sand. I saw this, this, you know, and I saw the inside was burnt. Well, I swam along the sides a lot of times. Flounders would sit alongside next to logs. So I'm looking for them. Oh, it's a, oh, it's a big square end. Whoa, that's not a log. It's a dugout. And a prehistoric Indian dugout of that. I swam to the other end. About 24, 25 feet down, 
not a square end. Well, so I got my scuff over there, got my outbound mold, pulled the sand off the inside of it. You know, since I was used to moving the cypress logs, my skiff, you know, doing that. So I got my hands underneath uh, a boat, I tried to loosen it. My hands went for the bottom of the boat. The wood was so hot and I just like, like wet bread. So, if I known very thing, can me always coming. The ants were still good. I should have brought the ants home, but I didn't. Good thing I'll the whole thing up and it's gone. Yeah. Police, I had a pleasure of finding a prehistoric boat uh, that way. Now, I have found four historic ones from the 1850s up to the 1920s in the same area, uh, and out in the marsh. But in front of trappers, when pulling the boats up to the landing, I'm going to tie it to a stake, lay on a pole, and leave a water logged. You keep it in the water year round, keep, keep it swelled up tight, keep the water tight. Eventually, one people die off, one people get burned in the mud. That's how I find them. Look at those places. The last one I found uh, was just, uh, I'm sorry, was jammed between uh, two cypress trees on the side. And I can see it's a cypress board. And I'm always looking for pieces of cypress. Um, not, I got bulked up by, by hurricanes, scattered in swamps. I can use those to make a boat ribs or seats and things like that, you know. And I pulled it out. I, I realized just the bottom of the boat, all of the stuff's just the bottom on one end. The rest is completely gone. Ten years later, I found out who had that boat. And, uh, his father, uh, was a commercial fisherman, I showed it to Peggy and Labor too. He said, hey, that's my father's boat. He said, he lost it in 1947 hurricane. So he said, you want it back? I said, nah, keep it. <laughs> so I still have it. So I've got, um, I found one, one big honey island dugout, uh, about 60 feet long. It's about I was frogging, and it saved my eye dug out, catching frogs with my hands. Of course, you know, let's see if what you grab it before you grab. You ever never know? Right? You think some fines? <laughs> anyway, so I saw this part of the dug out sticking up out of the water and a log jam. I said, what's this? That doesn't look natural. I got closer to it. Hmm. And when my hands down underneath it, I felt this. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Got another one? So I flyed it and came back in the morning. Got, got in the water, pulled all the trash off of it, got it up. One side was missing. But the rest of the boat was five feet wide, only 18 inches of missing on one side. All I had to do was sit on the good side and tip the bottom out of the water. I put that back on the boat landing like that. And I bought that boat here a couple of times, and Mr. Pete has seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's typical of the Hunter Island boats, wide, no trim work, no end pieces, no, no, uh, no keel here. And just come out round like a wide spoon at both ends. Not just full powder, fast river currents and the Pearl River system. There's nothing for the water can hold off. There's no keel there or anything. So the water just flows right around it. It's very easy to put against the current in that boat. So those honey on that dugouts were wide, three or four feet wide, from 16 feet to 18 feet long, and carrying livestock when the river flooded. So they would catch the hogs, uh, small cows, tie them, truss them, and put them in the dugouts, and put them to high ground, and dump them out, Go back out. I still more the livestock off the islands in the swamp, keep them from drowning during, during the floods. So no time is now went back about how many hogs they could haul in their dugouts, how many pigs they could get in there. <laughs> okay, and I spent many a night fogging back in the marsh they swamps. They weren't just used for fishing or duck hunting. Some of them are pretty large. Up here in North Louisiana, some of the dugouts are very large. Uh, and the descriptions of them on the Mississippi River are made out of cottonwood trees that are uh, 20, 30 feet long 
and uh, I've seen old pictures of them at Catahoula Lake in central Louisiana where two people are sitting abreast in the dugouts. Uh, and you have to come back to what Keith and Tom are saying about that's half a tree. Uh, and uh, so you're looking at some really huge timber. And uh, what, what Keith, you said in the 40s, the last ones you knew about they were building? Yeah, they were running out of logs. Yeah. They started, uh, That's the same story we all grew up with. They quit building the dugouts. And they took, North Louisiana boats took the same sequence that Keith gave you for, the, for his P-Rows right down to the plywood and that changed uh, right now it's hard to find a hand-built boat up here anywhere uh, Arkansas travelers put the boat builders pretty much out of business and uh, but they built basically the same same forms you guys see in aluminum or fiberglass now the little flat nose batos uh, and uh, the skiff forms with the points on them pretty rare up here uh, up the Mississippi River, there are a few, but on the inland rivers, uh, you mostly get batos, uh, which have got punt ends. They're flat on both ends. And uh, the, uh, my grandfather built boats very much like Keith's talking about. They were, they were very narrow at the back end where you had to paddle them and wider in the front. That's a pretty common way to do it, I guess. And I never thought about it till you told me you walk. <laughs> we, but, the other thing was that the families, like you say, each family had their own style. Everyone's was a little different than everybody else's. And, uh, and we normally we kept a set of forms and, and went down from, the forms we had went down from my, my grandfather's to, to me. Uh, and so we, we cut our templates off of those, just made them out of wood. And we used those same templates for, for the ribs and the batos and cut them out. And those boats were built up until the 50s. And we substituted cypress board bottoms and uh, turned into, you know, three quarter inch marine plywood bottoms till the pieces got too short and you couldn't get the plywood. And uh, the, uh, but we used cypress bottoms, uh, cypress board bottoms. Uh, when I was a kid, little kids, four and five years old, that was our job. We caulked the bottoms. They, they caulked them with oakum. They you make a little chisel-looking thing, and they give a kid a little little hammer, and he he caulked the bottoms. And you recalk the boats all the time. And uh, in the dugouts, you had to keep them wet. And Tom alluded to that. And the uh, and we'd sink them and bring them in and sink them, or you'd bring them in and fill them with moss and dump a couple of buckets of water in the moss to keep them wet. So they dry out to crack. And so you try to keep them in the water. And they, uh, so they lasted a long time. They're very hard to find now. The Williamson Museum has three. Tom built one of them. Uh, we have one there that's 150 years old that went the life of the lifespan of the, of the dugouts, or the P-Rows for that matter, up here. They turn into a water trough for the cattle. And uh, that's generally the end of them. They take them out of the water and put them up keep water in them for the cows and horses, and then they gradually break apart. The one I have turned into a flower box. Lady had petunias growing in it when we found it out in the front yard. And it's got some big holes where it rotted out. I think if she hadn't farmed it, it would have still been there. But they'd patched it with tin, covered it with tar. They tried to keep that boat as long as they could. But it's built Indian style. It has no points on the ends. It's pun ended. It looks like almost like a bateau end. It's, it's just flat on both ends. Uh, there's a very large prehistoric one in the state exhibit building in Shreveport that's almost 35 feet long. Uh, big cypress log one that was burned and scraped out. Uh, radiocarbon date on it's about 1000 AD. It came out of the sediment here in Red River. And uh, it's probably the oldest boat in the state, uh, but it's, it's a Stone Age boat. And uh, it's a Caddo boat, probably. It has a little hole in the front where there's a little fire, mm -hmm. so they could build a little yeah. fire on the it's top of the end. Of it. like string, yeah, like a hole in the front, and, and the hole is quite, quite that big. Yeah, in, in South America, South America still do that. Yeah, they take push poles once you want a boat on the, up on the bank, put push poles, pull the hole about, jam it yeah. on the bank, and just up ashore. Yeah, and hold them in place. But this one's got a little fire spot in it where they kept a fire. Uh, so it's an interesting boat if you're up that way. 
drop by and look at it. it the uh, it's made out of a round log. It's not dressed up like like other like folks would be now. And so they picked that, and it's probably three quarters of the cypress log. And then they mm -hmm. burn it down. But everybody that I knew, and I grew up around old people. The last boats were built on Catahoula Lake in about 1938, 39, and then they ran out of Cypress. And um, the, uh, so I, I have some of those tools that passed down through the family. And they were made in the 1700s. And they used them continually up until the 1930s. The, uh, so it's kind of a lost thing. Uh, we drilled the holes. <laughs> and uh, Tom mentioned that. And I didn't look at yours a while ago. You got holes in yours in the dugout? No, you don't. You do it the way Some time. of them I do. Uh, Maybe you could explain that to them. I don't know. They don't know what we're talking <laughs> Well, a couple things to start with. Uh, for a cypress tree, it, it takes, it's got to be 450 years old to make its oil, to make it good, rot resistant, and so the bugs don't eat it. That's the big difference between the old wood and today's wood we call growback. The growback can be 30 inches in diameter, but it's not old enough. It's not made that all yet. But you can get one of the acorns off of it, and if you crack it open, that sucker is gummy, 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 gummy. Well, to go back to a dugout, you have to have something that's around 850 years old for it to be wide enough to make you dug out. And then it's gonna have the oil in it. So, and Louisiana, and, and that's why I don't build them with a fire. You know, uh, the fire thing to me, the fire is gonna get the oil hot and it's either gonna cook the oil out or especially if you get close to the end, it's gonna make steam and that's gonna bust the ends open. And then the thing that, that Tom was telling you about, we'll only make it out of a half a log, is because in that 850 years old, a uh, hurricane came through. And that hurricane is either going to push the tree down or it's going to bend the tree and the tree's going to start shearing, wind's going to let up and it's going to come back. And so all, all your cypress logs are going to have that shake in them. Because I don't know how many storms have come through in that 850 years, but there's got to be a many of them. And somewhere in there, when you look at the end of the cypress log, it's not going to be a line going straight across. It can be a line coming down uh, a foot or two feet and then going off in the other direction. And what we do is we'll turn that log until we can see that, that we can make a boat out of here. And so then we take that and then we cut it to get that piece out of there. And if the tree is big enough, you might be able to get three out of that fork. And you never use the middle of the tree because the middle of the tree is the bad part. And so if you can look at some of our scrapbooks out there and see where we got them cut in half and you'll see that heart will pop out. Or you, uh, when the, a long time or several hundred years ago, the Indians would use the whole thing. And but they would pop out. They just go get another tree, you know. But in in Louisiana, you could do that up until the the middle of the 1800s, you know. And then what happened to Louisiana and Alabama and and Georgia and everywhere else where they got swamps? That your New York cities burned down, and Chicago's burned down. And they kept using all their wood. They kept getting out further and further, trying to get wood, and they ran out of wood. But they had all the money in the world, and so they came down to the south, and they went to Alabama, or they come to Louisiana, wherever they could find a cypress swamp, and they had all these great big trees, you know, six feet in diameter, nine feet in diameter. And so they came down with the money, and they brought crews down here, they brought saw sharpeners, they brought everybody they need down to Louisiana. And they would buy a track of land. And it would take them about 30 years to cut all the trees down in that track. 
And so those people were Yankees, but those people became, after 30 years, they were Louisianans in, they were Alabamans, whatever. And so they became part of us. And so they came down in about the 1880s and they started chopping wood, chopping wood, chopping wood. And finally, in the 1930s, they didn't run out of wood. And so that's the end of the, the Cypress Logs. They clear cut everything. Uh, you can go back and look at old movies. Uh, uh, the Williams uh, Sawmill uh, was one of the largest sawmills in South Louisiana. And they were all rich people and they had movie cameras back then and they took movies of it. So if you ever go to Patterson, uh, Louisiana, you can go to the Williams uh, Museum there and you can see all these old saws, everything they used for logging. But the, the treasure that they have is that they got that, that movie, that old movie there, and show people out there uh, cutting the logs down and all that stuff. And you kind of look off in the background and there's not any trees there anymore. You know, because they would, they would cut the little trees down too, but they would use them and they would pile them up, you know, yay deep, and they would put rail on them. That's for the rail cars to go out there to get the cypress and bring it back. Or if they were in a boat, they had the old mules that would pull the logs out. And, and when I was getting started, and, and Tom too, back in the 50s and today, if you go down the, the rivers today, in the wintertime when they don't have leaves on the trees, you can see the little canals going off. You know, about every 50 feet, they got a little canal going off. And that's what it was. That's what they pulled those logs out of the woods. And they would pull them out, and they would make a little a little ditch. The next one would be a, bit of a, di a deeper ditch, and finally it might be six or eight feet deep where they pulled them out. And, and a trick they had that we didn't have, is if you're a duck hunter down there, you would know about it, is you'd be walking along, and then the next thing you do, you're over your head. And that's because uh, after a while, the, those uh, logs they pulled out would get hung up in the stumps of another tree that they were already cut the close ones. You know, they way back there, and, it, and it's getting deeper, and you're getting in those cypress roots. They just stick a stick a dynamite in there, boom, boom. And so when you duck hunting, you walk along there, next thing you know, your hat's floating. And, and that's why you stepped off in the dynamite hole, yeah. Come down that, I'm, I'm dropping those holes. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> yeah. It's a common experience. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But before they started coming and cutting all our trees down, you know, in the 1700s, uh, they made the, the, the dugouts were uh, 60 or 70 or 80 foot long. Right. You know, ever how long the tree was. Because they didn't go uh, out casually boat riding. Because if you went 30 miles down the, the river, you were going to be building boats for somebody else. So if you went somewhere, you went basically with a, a war party. So you had a 80 foot P row and you had. 60 or 70 people in there paddling it. And so you had them smaller, a 30 foot was small. So basically when the Europeans come over, they started making the small ones because the Europeans, they would wander all by themselves, you know, go out there and go trapping or looking for gold or whatever they was doing. Uh, the Indians before that, the, they stayed together for protection. That's why you had, they had uh, the P rows of then, or 30 foot or 80 foot, yeah. they were squared off, you know, because they didn't, have, they didn't want to spend the time to make them all fancy and all that kind of stuff. You know, they would be uh, six or eight foot wide, four feet deep, you know, and 80 foot long, they were big. Y'all have any questions? We got all kinds of stuff up here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you had talked earlier about the chime, the chimes on the inside and the outside. I can see on the outside where they act as a bumper or as a guard for it. Is there any advantage structurally or whatever to having them on the inside? You've got the transverses for the sides? You, you need them, you need the, the chime is so you can nail the bottom and the sides together. Okay, so you can't, you can't butt? You can with a plank. But it's hard to hit that little quarter-inch plywood. Uh, 
with an inch and a half nail. So you put that chine in there and you nail to the chine. Yeah, chine, basically that's just where the plank should have been, the side plank. You know, and uh, some of this pier on over the years, I, I built plywood that stops the plank like it has. <coughs> and uh, I finally ended up just sticking with side by sides and plywood at the bottom. I most, on several of my, boat, my boats, I found took less work in building a boat, using the solid side by sides, started going to extra labor. I'm putting the china and plywood here, the plywood there, this and that. So I just went back to use the cypress and finally went all the way back to uh, like where I started from back in, back in the mid 60s. Uh, all cypress plank boats. How do you figure how much it haul? How much weight do you carry on it? Well, if you don't want to use trigonometry, then you, uh, you put something in there. <laughs> <laughs> Put a bunch of people you don't really find. Yeah. You find all your happiest friends and yeah. you line them up in order. <laughs> you go look on your scales to weigh uh, cotton and you have 50 pound uh, blocks. And you, you can put some, some of those can be heavy in the water. Yeah. Pounds of weight. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if y'all had some kind of scale to figure out what, how much weight you could put in there to carry if you were going somewhere with all your camping equipment. It didn't sink the thing. Well, when I was younger and had a full mind, I could, I could figure the uh, a, a triangle and, and how, much, uh, how much weight it would hold. And so you did the, the width time the length plus the depth, and then, then you took that and multiplied that from your seven, uh, seven gallon. You figure out how many cubic inches it hold and how many it was in a gallon, and then uh, how much seven pounds was. You know? and so, uh, 20 years ago, I could do that in my head, but all I can do now is just try to remember who I am. <laughs> part of that, part of the way they did it was they figured that they knew how much they wanted to put in it when they built it, so that they built the width and the length. They had the width, and the old people had the width and the length in their head. Well, is it any scale on how long you make them and how wide you make them? It varied, you want it varied on what they wanted to do with them. Like he was talking about the inboard motorboats, they're basically just just a, a flat, punt-ended skip, most of them, and the, 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 they figured out where the motor was going to go and the weight of the motor, and so it determined the length of the boat to some extent. You know, I bet you have to balance the back end and the front end to get the motor in. The, uh, and so it's it kind of length and width, like you say, and the depth determines how much water it's going to take. Well, everybody that, that built a boat wasn't a boat builder. I mean, you need, you need to remember that to start with. Everybody that built a boat wasn't a boat builder. Yeah. Well, I don't understand that. <laughs> but but one, of the, one of the things that in the modern day is, is they did was uh, the, the size of the P-Roll was determined by the plywood industry. The, the plywood was only four foot wide. So you had a foot on each side of that for the sides and then what was left in the middle was the bottom and so if you could saw straight on the line you could have a 26 inch bottom piro if you couldn't then you'd have a 24 inch wide piro and so you could still have a you could have a 12 foot long piro or you could have a 14 or 16 or 24 but that was as wide as you was going to get it. And, and, and so from there, that was the standard size because that was what the standard plywood was. But, but then they started so making the five. They, the they, saw made, was they, they saw the cypress and, and made them the length they wanted to then before they come in the plywood, right? Yeah. yeah. They, if you're lucky, they'd saw it for you. Everything was sawed by hand, too. When you got ready to build the boats, you cut the whole bottom. <coughs> built the bottom flat and built the out the gunnels first and then you put the bottom on last and you, you, you plane the gunnels down to get the keel to get the boat to do what you want to do. It depends on how far you want to go back. When, right. you, when you go back enough, the bottom, the planks went sideways anyway. Yeah. So it didn't matter how wide you made it. Yeah. Make it 10 foot yeah. wide. If I wanted to make a, a, a boat wide on that, I didn't see the problem give you, because you probably have to buy another sheet of plywood to, to carry that. 
but make <coughs> the same. Uh, sometimes put uh, <coughs> kind of like like a pl like a plank in the center of it from the end to let's say from the transit to the bow, uh, notch it, I grab it, I pull it up into my plank. And then I need to get around uh, and put a, a bolt of water in it. I put it on one sheet, I've used two sheets, but you can put a plank, uh, grab it into the ribs, and then wait to notch that plank there. I put it, uh, the plow it half and half on this. Let's pretend this is a skip here. I'm, I'm ribs here. I put in the plank across here. I put half a sheet of plow in here, up here, into the rabbit. So you can get around, so you make it five feet, six feet wide if you want to do that. Of course, they've got some leftovers. You can use it for some other future projects. So you can get around the plow by using uh, <coughs> a plank like this, help keep uh, and take care of the edges intact on the plywood you know, and supporting it in that way. Yeah. Of course, we make the die out. First thing I do is bottom it, chop the sap off, get to the hardwood. Once you, once you have hardwood, I turn it to wood that you have dug out. To the cypress trees, and now you have a tape or two. So, uh, uh, it already gives you the shape, uh, uh, as we're talking about. Uh, uh, then bottom the tree, and John made a bow on the boat. <laughs>